Okay, hello everyone. I'm glad to welcome to this last session for today. And this is actually a panel. And I wonder if we have a lot of background noise. If maybe we can start try muting the other people who are not talking. It's actually a lot of background noise. Okay, so let, let's try to get started. So, so we uh, let me try to introduce the participants. So more like participants will introduce themselves so we can make a small round, virtual round table. Uh, so we can start uh, in the order how the uh, participants are listed here in the panel. So we will start from uh, Alexander. So Alexander, please tell a couple of words about yourself. Yes, hello, do you hear me? Yep. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, I am Alexander Popov. I live in Moscow, Russia. I'm a kernel developer since 2012. I started from kernel development for embedded systems. And three years ago, I fulfilled my dream and focused on Linux kernel security. I have a lot of fun with vulnerability discovery, exploited, exploitation um, of the vulnerabilities and kernel self-protection in positive technologies. And thank you very much for bringing me into this discussion. It is amazing that I can participate in LSS North America. Thank you, Alexander. So I guess Alison would be next. I am not nearly as cool. Uh, hi, I'm Alison. After a decade of writing software, mostly in user land, I have entered grad school and I am now a PhD student. Uh, I'm advised by Dr. Wu Song Feng, and my areas of interest include fuzzing, automation, and security architectures. So my OS experience these days is much more centered around Cherry BSD and Cherry capability hardware, as well as working with fuzzing tools and trying to integrate those into developer workloads. I, uh, I'm a little bit of the wild card on this panel, I'm afraid. Live discussion is good. Thank you, Alison. So I guess next would be a key case. Um, hi, yep. Yeah. Um, my name is Case Cook. Uh, I'm employed by Google, and I have been focusing on uh, upstream Linux uh, kernel security and mitigation work. Um, I sort of heard the cats that uh, make up the kernel self protection project, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Case. And Mimi next. Hi, um, I work for um, IBM TJ Watson, the research center, and I, I work on the integrity subsystem here in the Linux kernel, and I've been doing that for over 10 years now. So. Thank you, Mimi. So I guess uh, I can go last. Um, so I'm Elena, I'm with Intel, and I have been doing various aspects of platform security and mostly Linux security, I think, for the past like 12 years. And I have been touching very various parts of systems and recently also been kernel. I also have a background in crypto, and recently I have kind of partly getting back to also to my crypto. Uh, part of uh, expertise, though. But uh, let's now move to the panel itself. So the title of the panel, as everyone can see, is that well, what's lacking in Linux security and what are we should be doing about this? And uh, the way to kick off this discussion, so we have asked our panel members to prepare some, I don't know, couple of minutes or whatever we want to tell initially on the topic. So we're going to have an hour round around our virtual table where each panel member maybe brings like one aspect he considers important. And then uh, at the same time, the audience is encouraged to ask questions and you can do it using this Q&A interface and you can ask questions to particular panel members. So you can just indicate where in the writing that will to case or to Mimi or and so on. Or you can just ask another question to a panel. So all panel members can see the questions so we can um they can decide to answer it later in this free discussion or maybe answer it during the time they're 
or if they're already talking. And and let's see, we, we would really love to make it like, you know, live discussion without too much kind of interaction or in, intervention from at least my side. But let's see how it goes. So I mean, I've never done it before, virtual panel, so we'll see. So let's start again now around round table. So Alexander, if you could maybe bring a point or things you're thinking on the matter first. Yeah, thanks. So 20 years ago, Bruce Nair said that security is a process, not a product. It is true and it is pity because uh, there is no easy solution for Linux security uh, challenge. But it is great because we have plenty of interesting work and it is enough for everyone. I think uh, Linux kernel security needs more people and organizations involved in it. Uh, there are many sectors in this area and first I want to list security aspects in Linux kernel development process. Um, first, uh, Linux kernel patch attestation. Konstantin Rabitsev, the administrator of kernel.org, works on that. It is very important. Next, uh, kernel testing and especially continuous kernel fuzzing. Fuzzing is a very powerful me method of vulnerability discovery and we all really appreciate the work by Dmitry Vyukov and awesome Syscaller team. Next, uh, static analysis and variant analysis. They are becoming more and more popular as well and integrating them into the kernel development lifecycle could definitely improve the code quality, but uh, that requires more resources and more people as well, since these technologies provide bug reports that should be handled by kernel developers and maintainers. Next, uh, I think about responsible disclosure procedure for kernel security issues. Personally, I think it works quite well. I used it several times and an important part of it is handled by Linux distros mailing list, which is organized by Solar Designer. Uh, Alexander Pisliak. Next, uh, applying the security fixes for the stable trees. Stable kernel maintainers do enormous work, but they need more resources and regression tests, uh, as JAR security people often highlight. And I'm sure uh, Brad will mention that again in his talk tomorrow. As possible ideas from me, I see deeper Linux kernel vulnerability tracking and security bug bounty in some form. I don't know, maybe that could be valuable. But that were the security related procedures of kernel development. And now I want to look briefly at kernel security technologies. There are a lot of bugs in the kernel code, as we know, and we can't magically fix them all. So, so we have the alternative ways. First, kernel has very good detection mechanisms, sanitizers and various checks, which are being constantly improved. Uh, they give really excellent results in combination with continuous kernel fuzzing. And there are also the kernel self-protection mechanisms that mitigate vulnerability classes or make exploitation methods harder. And the pioneers in this area are people from JAR Security and PAX team. And Case Cook uh, leads the kernel self-protection project where, where kernel developers work on such technologies for the mainline kernel. And it is extremely important. And uh, that area is also very exciting, I think, uh, because uh, here in, in this area, you can combine the offensive and defensive security research. You can create proof of concept exploits for kernel vulnerabilities, develop uh, the fixing patches, do responsible disclosure, uh, invent kernel self-protection techniques that could help against your own exploits. And Jan Horn from Project Zero does this kind of research, which is really inspiring for me personally. And usually these kernel self-protection features don't come for free. They bring performance penalty. They bring various additional requirements for kernel developers and sometimes make the kernel debugging harder. So I think it is very important to choose the kernel security features depending on the threat model of the information system which you build. Uh, so I created the Linux kernel defense map that can help in this task. This map shows the relationships between vulnerability classes, exploitation techniques, bug detection, bug detection mechanisms, and kernel defense technologies. So when you know, when you developed the threat model 
of your information system, which is based on Linux kernel, you can choose the kernel hardening features, cut the kernel attack surface, and finally choose the proper security policy for user space and enforce it using the LSM, Linux security modules. And I also uh, created the tool called kconfig harden check. That tool uh, is used to check the Linux kernel kconfig against the hardening preferences. And I'm very glad that uh, some uh, Linux distributions already use it uh, in their kernel development. And I even know that some big companies use quietly without uh, credit uh, this tool for commercial security audits, which is uh, funny. Uh, and now let me return to the beginning of this small talk. So Linux kernel security needs people and organizations and people um, who really have this hacker spirit, who really love this work. Otherwise, if you work on things that you don't love, you can't get the uh, your personal best results. And organizations, Linux kernel security needs organizations that really understand its importance and are, re are ready to invest real resources, not rhetorically, but in reality, to Linux kernel security. So that is my point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. So very, you have brought many interesting points and I'm, I'm hoping we'll touch on them later. But I would like to move to our next panel member to give an opportunity for her to also introduce points she, con she considers important. So Alison, you will be next. There we go. So, Alexander is much more versed in the kernel. What I'm going to push back against is that the definition of Linux security should not end at the user land boundary. I think this is a myth, one of several, that I think that the community has indulged in for some time. And what's really lacking is facing some of those and making some peace and agreeing about what our trade-off model is. Like, there are different threat models out there. What's the primary one? So I think the biggest fairy tale we have in open source in general, but in Linux in particular, is the myth of the perfectly rational, perfectly forward user who's read all the security documentation, knows how all the features work, has outlined a very detailed security model and threat model, and can make all the appropriate decisions. The vast majority of people just install their distro and move on with their day. Uh, red teams think this is great. Uh, features move between distros at disjoint pace, moving stuff up spring takes a while. This gives them lots of windows to get stuff done. But I think that's a thing that we tend to do as a community. And I said open source in general likes to do this too. Oh, that's dangerous. We'll let the user make the decision about whether or not to enable that feature. And the reality is, is most of them don't. A lot of the security features sit in the waste bin off by default, and they're not really doing us much good. Uh, the other thing I often see is that this sort of myth of uh, performance. You can have a security feature as long as it doesn't impact performance under all arbitrary workloads ever. Uh, we've already got what security features meet those bars. We're not really going to advance if we keep holding to that. I think at least different distributions need to decide our workload model is this. We're going to test perf against that. We're going to test our security features against those models and make those trade-offs knowing that this is the workload we are optimizing for. We've got a lot of distribu distributions. We don't have to be all things to all people, but we seem determined to do that. And it's kind of upsetting to see security features almost always stop when it comes to going upstream. Uh, another thing that's maybe less interesting to this group would be, I worry sometimes when I see users who are like, particularly students, who say, oh, I don't have to worry about security. I use Linux. Now, I'm going to admit that when I was a young and feckless undergrad, I totally enjoyed watching the Windows people patch their software and going, oh, updates? That's nice. You have a virus. Mm, maybe you shouldn't use Windows. Um, but now that isn't really the case. Like, Linux is just as much a target, sometimes even more so. And I think a lot of the user base still thinks that Linux, by default, protects them from security evils. And maybe that's a little bit of our fault. Maybe it's not. It's a food for thought. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Elena. Thank you, Alison. So um, very interesting, like uh, Alexander and Alison points were really like on, on, on very different 
angles and very different sides of it. So it's, I think it's, it, it's really nice to have so many different angles. So I guess next would be case. Um, sure. <clears throat> um, I think a lot has already been covered. <laughs> um, I think um, really looking at uh, sort of the, the history of where we see a lot of uh, uh, flaws, I think we need to start thinking more seriously about uh, memory safe languages uh, that, that don't have garbage collection. Um, and, and I think the uh, an area that I uh, got touched on here, but I think is really important is testing. Like we cannot evaluate whether anything is fixed if we don't have a test. We, we shouldn't accept kernel code that doesn't also have a test. Um, this is sort of a, a fundamental problem with, with how things are going uh, in, in the upstream kernel. Uh, that's going to require some change in, in how the, uh, the, the social expectations uh, and how things should, should be organized in upstream. Um, getting a push for actual testing, I think, is going to be really important uh, because that gives us the parameters for avoiding bugs in the first place. Uh, it lets us you know, bounce the fuzzer off of actual tests and things like that. Um, I think that that area is probably the, the biggest spot that I'd like to see changes uh, in, in the kernel community is actually writing the tests for the stuff that we work on. Okay, so case is 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 a tool. What? I mean, are you done or? Oh, yeah, that was it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's really hard we can, to we figure can, out yeah. when someone's done talking in this in this medium. Yeah. It's not just you. And I figure we can we can get into the individual. I mean, a lot is getting brought up. I figured we'd go through the intros first. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me sure. No, I just want, I just wanted to make mm -hmm. make sure I'm I'm not stepping over. Okay, yeah. so the last one would be yeah. Mimi. Over. Hi. Um. So <clears throat> I'm going to be speaking about one um what my area of integrity basically, and we're gonna I'll give you a short story to begin with. Um, my grandfather was a diamond broker. He didn't cut diamonds. He didn't even own the diamonds. He basically sold them. In today's terminology, he was the middleman, making the connection between the diamond owner and the buyer, and the potential buyers. He would receive the diamonds from the owner and show them to the potential buyers. But every aspect of the transaction was based on a handshake. There was no contract, just a handshake. A person's reputation was built on that handshake. Taking advantage of a deal obviously could happen once, twice, a couple of times, but it was limited. People learned who they could and couldn't trust. Unfortunately, um, handshaking in our time is kind of, we're not doing too much handshaking and maybe it will become a metaphor in the future for trust. But um, in, but going forward, um, we, um, the, in that, in my grandfather's environment, people knew each other or they knew somebody who knew somebody who knew the other person. And with, however, with each link, the degree of trust varied. At the same time, we, um, we trust different people for different things. I trust my family and friends to celebrate in good times and be supportive in bad times. I trust the dentist, I trust my doctor, but I trust them all for different things. Um, certification can provide some level of trust but it varies. So, and if we take this metaphor from how people behave uh, to our world of computers, we're living at a time where, where we need to have trust. We need to trust the manufacturers. We need to trust the suppliers. We need to trust the firmware, the OS, the applications to do what is expected and nothing else. And we know how well that is working. We need the equivalent of a handshake to be identified 
to be able to identify the provenance of files on our systems before we can actually trust them. So for years now, I've been asking everyone to sign and distribute file signatures with the file data. I'm finally now hearing murmurings of it actually happening by a number of different companies. Will this be the year that we actually finally see it? Will it be the year that the good values are published? So, but file provenance, knowing where the files are coming from is just the beginning. Afterwards, even once we have all the files signed and we know what's going, where they're coming from, we need to be able to differentiate at different levels. We need to be just like we differentiate between my doctor and any doctor or my dentist and other dentists. We need to be able to differentiate who's doing the signing and, and how we're going to do it. Is it, is it going to be just one signature or is it multiple signatures? Is it at the package level um, so that different systems can be signed, can be installed on different systems and the, and the distro or whoever else is signing all the packages? Or is it going to be allowing the user to make that decision, the user, the customer, so on? And I hope we get to the point where the customer, the end user, will control what can run where, um, but the packages themselves need to be signed. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. OK, so I think we're done with our first initial round table. Thanks. So we have gotten actually a lot of already a lot of questions through the interface. Um, I don't know how we want to make it. Just try going one by one, and whoever wants from the panel, because most of them are generic questions to the panel, to all panel members. So I can just read a question, and then whoever wants to comment on that can just just start commenting. So there are not too many. We should not speak all over. So the first question was to the panel, so what do you see as the main reason for very large number of bugs in every kernel release? And what should be done, changed to reduce the number of bugs introduced? Uh, maybe we should start from ourselves or, but uh, in a way, it's like the, the code is, is how the code is written and it's, it's, it's one of the, the big problem. But uh, who wants to comment on this? So this was generic question to the panel. Um, I think this gets into into testing. Like we can't we can't have any certainty that things are working without the tests. Um, fuzzing has been a, a great way to effectively create tests blindly um, and and define the boundaries of things that went untested. Uh, but when we have so much that is untested, uh, fuzzing is pretty important. Uh, but it'd be better to have direct tests. Um, that's that I think is my my main answer to that. Yeah, actually, I would I like to add. Moved. Go ahead, Alexander. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to add, uh, when I use fuzzing for searching vulnerabilities and think of it, I always see that it is missing the actual check whether the kernel handled some input correctly or not. So uh, when we fuzz the kernel, we check that it didn't crash. So there is no some memory corruption or uh, bad behavior, but we don't check whether the kernel handled this particular system call correctly uh, as we expected. And yes, I agree with case. So this part is missing and maybe there are a lot of logical bugs uh, in, in this uh, improper handling of uh, the input from the kernel. Anyone else still wants to comment on this? Well, I'll throw in uh, one last one. Sure. Uh, so the fuzzing, so the research community really likes fuzzing the kernel because it's considered one of the hardest targets to hit. It's a popular target for any sort of testing 
or um, verification tool. One, because people who write the grants really like to hear about making half the world more secure, but also because it's considered very difficult, right? As kernels are one of the most complex and difficult things to thoroughly test and thoroughly verify. Um, so the fact that we throw large numbers of lines of code in there every release means that we're sort of exponentially increasing the number of possible paths and places there could be bugs, right? Maybe part of the answer is to make the releases smaller. We might end up with fewer bugs. More testing and more thorough testing is definitely part of it. And there are a lot of places where that can be improved, but it's a hard, it's a hard nut to crack. That is all. Uh, but I guess this slowing down the releases, so making like releases smaller and stuff, it's, it's, it's like, it's basically saying that we are going to raise the quality assurance in releases. So it, I guess, goes back to testing. So obviously, we can't stop the features from going in, but there are a lot of features coming out. That's also true. And I do support everyone point on testing because it, it's actually quite, um, I remember back in time when, um, what was I working on? Oh, I think it was the ref count work. And I needed to modify ref counters to, to use this new interface in different parts of the kernel. And many subsystems, when I was proposing the changes, they would go back to me and say that, oh, you, you should test it before, obviously, like you should test the change before you're proposing. And it was actually for some places, it was very hard for me to find because I didn't want to write my own test from scratch. I didn't have any bandwidth to do this for all kinds of different subsystems. I didn't know, especially. And for some places, it was very hard to find tests to run. Like, I mean, ready tests, which I could like go and start. And, and, and in that light, I think this point about testing is, is, is really kind of answers, in my opinion, also this mystery, the question to the panel that we had. So, but maybe let's let's move to the next set of questions. So uh, I'm going to write or uh, read two next questions together because they're kind of continuing our uh, one point. So the next question is a big problem with static code analysis. I think this is reflects on what Alexander was talking in the beginning when he was talking about what we need to do with static code analysis on the kernel. So the, uh, and the question is the big problem with static code analysis is a huge number of false positives which are generated. Do you know any method of, of to reduce this? And also, do you think of the static code analysis which are built into JCC version 10 and plan? So, Alexander, do you want to comment on that or anyone else also? Um, some time ago, I used uh, different static analysis tools for, uh, for applying to Linux kernel and I see that the false positive rate depends on how deep the tool understands the specifics of the kernel. And that depends. So uh, generic static analysis uh, will not work for the kernel because it is too specific. And But at the same time, writing the custom rules against some particular bug pattern bug patterns uh, for situations bad situations in the kernel which you as a developer of the kernel understand that uh, could be could work better and uh, have less false positives and moreover there are several tools which uh, can be integrated into the kernel build process and uh, it is some kind of uh, hybrid method of uh, co combining the static analysis and uh, uh, binary analysis. Some, sometimes it uses the uh, the tracing output, and you can get the missing information uh, from uh, other types of analysis and bring it into static analysis and find really interesting results. So I think uh, I really like uh, this. Um, uh, this phrase let computers do their job so uh, big uh, kernel is really big and analyzing it uh, manually is impossible so let's uh, write some really really nice uh, rules detecting uh, the bugs and give the computer the, the chance to find these bugs thank you alexander anyone want else wants to comment on this? 
If not, then we can move to the next question. Next question is officially to Alexander, but I think it's actually an interesting enough question that I think everyone could kind of answer that from their own point of view. So the question is that, Alexander, you, you mentioned that we need more people working on security. If you would have five additional people, what would you assign them to and how would it improve security? So I think it's like really questions for everyone. So what people think like where these five additional people could be used, I guess, case would assign them all to testing. Yeah. So what are our opinions? I think Case is the best person to answer this question. <laughs> he has a very big to-do list. I think Case will just put yeah. them all to testing, right and test. Uh, I mean, I think that's the right place, but I, I think I think actually, uh, you know, hiring five people to do testing doesn't actually get the change that we want because we want a social change. Um, you want the person who's writing the feature to write the tests um, and to really understand how to write tests. Um, so five people won't scale. Uh, we need everybody to really understand that testing needs to be part of the development process. Um, and maybe those five people need to be hired to wander around and harass people into writing tests or to help them see the examples. I'm not really sure. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's a, it, it needs to be a cultural shift. And I think doing that by example is probably the most powerful way to do it. That's all I was thinking. Anyone else has ideas for five additional persons? Could I have one of them to run a bug bounty program? Like that can be a full time job. <laughs> and I would like one um, I would like someone to um, help with the scripts and interpreters to help the user space. We now have um, there was some work done on Python, but Python isn't the only interpreter to take to pass down the May Ome exec. And we need um, more people um, helping on the interpreters. Back to you. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we, with five people, we won't be very far, but um, I don't know if, 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 I think any amount would be great to get additional people. So I think one, one person which I can think would have, where one person's time could be spent into is that I remember it was, I think, Last year, Linux Security Summit Europe, but uh, we had a talk by a Manpage maintainer, and he was complaining there's no one who is actually properly maintaining man pages and making sure that the description actually matches the what's happening with kernel behavior, and that he showed like could create many many security problems. So I think that would be one person you can also spend some circles on, but at least from my side. So okay, let's go try to read the next question. Uh, so, let me add um, as well. I, I have an idea yeah. about it. So, um, in some conversation, I heard a really nice idea. Um, so, we can find the proof of concepts, public proof of concepts um, exploits for Linux kernel vulnerabilities and make uh, syscaller fuzzer uh, uh, find the bugs which uh, were exploited by by this proof of concept exploits. So, uh, I mean, teaching the syscaller how to hit the particular bug which were security was security relevant. Uh, currently, syscaller uh, during the fuzzing finds all the bugs and only little part of them are security relevant, and maybe uh, making the fuzzing process focused on security uh, bugs would be really valuable. So five people in this task and Dmitry Vyukov would be happy. Yeah, I guess we, we're going to talk maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to actually have a second session, uh, also a panel session at the end of the day. And we'll have actually Dmitry Vyukov participating in that panel session. So we can actually, he might be able to comment at that time. So. So we can continue the discussion there. So going forward, actually, I can see that there are a lot of questions coming. Let's see if we're able to get down to the list um, in the time we have allocated. So next question is also, 
Are any of you applying machine learning techniques to study uh, the code analysis and fuzzing? So basically, machine learning for study code analysis and fuzzing. So anyone wants to comment? Yeah. That seems tailor made the academic I, researcher. Uh, so there is a lot of research in that space ongoing in the academic circles, but ML is not, it's very hot right now, but it's not the hammer for every nail. And so some of the things they are finding is ML is actually a bad fit for some of this, but there is sort of active engagement. I don't know that any of it's really ready for prod, but there is active work going on in that space. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I wanted to say that Yesterday was an excellent talk by Sasha Levin, and he mentioned that he uses some uh, neural network for uh, for uh, searching the patches which are relevant for stable, and that helps uh, to people who review patches for stable and uh, filters the patches. Okay, I guess that's a good pointer. I think all the talks are recorded, so if people want to see the talk which has passed, I mean, both for Linux Security Summit or for OSS, so you can go and watch the talk, so like the talk Alexander recommended just now. So does anyone want to comment still on machine learning, or should we move? Going once, okay. So the next question is actually a set of questions about the testing. So we're basically asking what testing challenges are we seeing in security space and uh, what should we really improve and change in the testing. So we partly already talked about it. I don't know if Case, for example, you want to add anything there or? Sorry, I keep dropping out. Um, I, think, I think an interesting uh, piece on, on the testing is uh, it would be nice if we can sort of get subsystem maintainers to, you know, we're not going to get it. There is no such thing as really top down in Linux kernel development. So I'm pretty sure if we ask Linus nicely, if we can no longer accept code, unless there is a test for it, he's going to say no. Um, so usually uh, what we need to do is get subsystem maintainers to say, Hey, look, you need to have a test for this before I'll accept that code. And as that, uh, as, as other subsystem maintainers see that that actually improves things uh, in those subsystems, that becomes something that more and more people want to see. Uh, and I think that's probably the only way to actually make change uh, in the kernel ecosystem itself. Yeah, so basically start from maintainers. And I think when it comes to maintainers, they have very different policies. So some are much stricter about testing, but some are you can say more relaxed. So, so yeah, this varies greatly. We don't have any kind of uniform, to my knowledge, understanding or even alignment about the matter. So, anyone yeah. else still wants to comment? Yeah. I do. Go, go um, ahead. Thank you. Um, so, one of the major changes that I'm having is with. Um, that with the TPM with hardware, basically, where how do you how can we get it? The TPM changes, and we need to be able to do testing with all different packages and all different releases, but that's software. But how do we test with different versions of hardware, and how can we automate this testing in the... Um, it would be nice to be able to do this, you know, the same way that we do package testing with just spin up another... Um, um, it, VM or another container or something, it would be nice if we could somehow tie this into actual hardware. Yeah, I think that's actually a big, po big point regards to we don't have even like emulator, we don't have anything which would be reliable, reliable for this matter. So it's a hard problem. It's a hard problem. Yeah, I agree. Right now, I have a number of laptops on my kitchen island to help with this. 
Yeah, actually, my, my, I had a problem with testing against TPM last week, just so that I also run into the case that I, I, I don't actually have. And with setup, I've got, I've, I've got to have very weird setup for a different reason. But when I realized that, okay, I've got this very weird setup where I'm able to test what I need to test, but I also need to have TPM working, and it actually wasn't working for that case. I mean, it was partly emulated environment, but yeah, it's, I see what you mean. Okay, so should we move then next uh, to next question? So the next question is actually for Mimi because it relates to integrity. So Mimi, what do you want to see to improve in file provenance, PGP encryption, blockchain, or another similar immutable ledger or open question? My favorite question. I want, I want them, I want the files to be signed by the person who's who creates the files? This is user packages. I want, um, I want the signature to be included in the um, in the RPMs in Debian in whatever package maintainer you have. Um, we already have methods for verifying the signatures. We just need their inclusion for so that the file data and the file metadata come together, and that it's not something that you do post install but that they're delivered um, and packaged together. Hope Thank you, Mimi. The questioner. I, I hope so. I'm, I'm not so... This is, I guess, this is the downside of virtual panel is that even if like you're supposed to now answer a question, if there is a follow-up question, it's gonna show up somewhere at the end of this many pages and, and there won't be a way to actually map the follow-up to this. So. So let's see if we get to follow up questions. So, but if I start to jump, I'm just too afraid. But like, if I'm jumping between the pages, we will miss some questions. So I'm trying to take them consequently. So yeah. So the last question on this side is uh, is again on kernel testing. So there is a comment from a person here saying that I'm related to a new kernel developer, and I was actually somewhat shocked at the lack of testing for patches. I understand that there is a lot of testing which happens on the maintainer side. Is it something we should be more public? So basically saying that uh, should the maintainer share some wisdom with us and, and kind of explain how they're testing with patches. So and we have a couple of maintainers on this panel, so maybe they can pound, comment on that. So there are a lot of testing. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of different architectures. Um, for testing the kernel, um, you have LTP, you have um, you have the XFS tests, you have um, you have the um, the kernel self tests, you have um, the new. I was just someone just recently told me about K unit tests, but it would be really nice to have a set of security tests. So that we could see how they can how they will work together, and that's one thing that's um, missing. And we need more of the tests. So if you're new and you're looking to help write tests, um, there are many pack there are many um, packages that are already exist that need help, um, and I can point you in the right direction. Thank you, Mimi. Does anyone else? case you do some testing certainly yourself you're not uh, suggesting I mean, <clears throat> only for others well i mean uh, in, in the security so for security mitigations i've tended to where possible um write tests for this the lkdtm uh, module tests for all these things that crash your kernel or kill threads and do other stuff uh, my intent has always been to test uh, any feature that gets added that any mitigation feature that gets added so um, from that perspective, uh, I think that there is a fair bit of coverage on that, um, and it tries to test classes of problems uh, that should get caught by by various mitigations. Um, so LKDTM does have a bunch of those tests already. I think we need I think it needs to be a lot bigger than that. Thank you, Case. Does anyone want yeah. to? Yeah, I would yeah, like to add. I, I think that uh, uh, sysbot reproducers, uh, which 
cause crushes in the kernel are really mm, a really brilliant resource and uh, it would be nice if they if uh, those reproducers somehow uh, can be integrated in the kernel continuous integration for, uh, some kernel continuous integration frame framework because um, sysbot has a lot of information about the about the kernel actually it has the version which crushed it has the reproducer uh, which crushed the kernel uh, it even uh, does bisection uh, it finds the patch from which the kernel started uh, to behave bad so it has a lot of information and uh, this information could be integrated into uh, for example the process of uh, uh, preparing stable trees or something like that so it is it is clearly the regression tests which w with against the bugs which were fixed and maybe uh, running them con uh, continuously for let's say every kernel release uh, could could find uh, really nice bugs and uh, solve a lot of headache i think Thank you, Alexander. Anyone else wants to comment? Or should we? I don't know, actually, how much time do we have? Is it like till 14 minutes? Do we have one full hour for the panel? I think it goes think to so. 55. OK, yeah. OK, so um, let's continue. So um, um, There are more questions on the other pages. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm saying I'm, 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 I'm not down even to the first page, so, <laughs> so we have to speed up. Or, but the questions are visible, so people can, and actually, the quest, person who asks a question is also visible. So if anyone wants to, if we don't get to answer all the questions, if you want to answer to people directly after, I think that would be great. So, so the next question we're going to take about your regression box. So uh, re there is a question: regression box are disappointment. How does this still happen to kernel development? Do te tests get dropped to what's going on? So this is actually an interesting question because we have had regression bugs and we have had bugs which I think showed up like after years and showing that it's like it was a regression introduced a couple of years ago. So anyone wants to comment on this disappointment case? Sorry, I keep dropping. Um... Yeah, I mean, we just don't have testing. That's I, it. I think the point, <laughs> yeah, I, I think here the point would may, maybe if I try to kind of speculate on the point that the uh, person who was asking questions trying to bring is that do the case, tests get dropped? So is it really like, do we only get these cases when we don't have tests? Or is it like, um, is it possible that you had a test and then we caused a regression which was somehow I mean, but it gets unnoticed because regression can be not just functional. Well, um, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of cases where we regress a major test. Um, I think, we, you know, we've rewritten the entire, the entire exec path, for example, and we only have very minimal uh, tests for the exec path. Um, we just sort of ad hoc examine it and make sure it's okay. And then we sort of kick it out and hope no one uh, notices any breakage. That's sort of been the, the, the style that testing happened with, which is here's the code, now someone else gets it tested. Um, but it would be nicer to have that. But uh, kernelci.org is, is sort of becoming the dashboard for are things building, are things running, um, and getting more tests in the kernel self-test tree, uh, I think will get us closer to being able to notice when things break because you know, you'll get a patch, uh, you know, a series gets thrown out on the list and it says it's broken. I say, okay, well, I won't pull that. Well, that's it. Thanks. Anyone else wants to comment? If not, then we can go to the next question. So, um, actually, we have a lot of questions on the testing. So, and we have discussed testing already quite quite extensively. So maybe we can take a t uh, question on the, the something else. Does anyone from panel see an interesting question? I mean, 
not out of the order which I want to take. There is a question like on memory leaks, but memory leaks makes our code vulnerable. Any suggestion tools to patch memory leaks in large code bases? Does anyone wants to comment on the memory leaks? There was a KMM leak uh, tool, uh, con config option of the kernel, uh, but I'm not sure whether it is alive right now. Case, do you know? I I haven't seen anything from it lately. And I guess memory leaks is considered like compared to some other vulnerabilities. It's Probably not as high as in people's radars. It's not like a first. It is not like use, use after it is three. It is like, service. Yeah. 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 So it's not probably the biggest problem which people are trying to, to fix first. So let's uh, see. There is the a big problem with memory leaks. Um, when it is, when you can trigger it, trigger it remotely, it uh, becomes a remote denial of service, which is. Uh, a very interesting bug. So um, there were some cases when uh, memory leak were, was reached in network subsystem was reached remotely, and uh, that was uh, that had quite high uh, CVSS score. How do we people think? So, is there any questions you particularly want to bring, or should we just keep going for the questions? I just fear that if there are some topics you want to discuss here, so we won't get to that down to the list because we have very little time to uh, left. So, does anyone want to bring some still one of the questions from the endless long list of questions, which we are certainly not going to reach? Uh, there's one that just popped up that might be um, interesting. This might also be throwing a stink bomb in the room. Sorry. Uh, Sean Thomas writes, who is looking out for bad actors within the community? And I think there was a talk yesterday discussing, uh, I, um, I think it's Wolfgang's, how many bad actors you might need in a community of open source to destabilize it or to erode trust or to make it non-functional. So... Tying back to his presentation yesterday, I think that's an interesting question. And one that isn't about testing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to add that uh, uh, open source uh, has uh, this supply chain problem. So uh, usually software uses some open source tools, uh, libraries and so on, which can be uh, uh, out of date or sometimes even backdoored. So it is very important to know which components does your software contain. So um, the patch attestation, which I mentioned uh, earlier, um, it, it is very important. Um, uh, if, if we speak about the se uh, secure development of some open source project and also some binary signing or uh, if you use um, the software which loads uh, some other components is important as well. And uh, as for patch attestation, I recommend checking the blog of Konstantin Rebitsev. Uh, he is the administrator, administrator of kernel.org and uh, he is working hard on improving the development process of Linux kernel community. Thank you, Alexander. Does anyone want to comment on this still? Should we move the next, the next? question it looks like we still might have time um 
Let's see, there's really many and most of them are actually about testing. There's one which is a bit of a user space sites. We have been covering a lot on the kernel. So there's a question is there's a lot of user space applications that interact with the web, for example, Chromium and mail daemons. Do those user space applications need any kernel security features that kernel lacks at the moment? So have we, because I think we recently our focus of people working on Linux security community has switched greatly to the kernel. So have we forgotten user space at all? Or what what do people think? So what what does user space need that we forgot to give? Well, do we actually even think about what various new kernel features or syscalls and whatnot, what the impact on user space is? I mean, I don't see a lot of people talking about, hey, I want this thing in the kernel for these reasons. I don't see a lot of discussion about why why or how it impacts user land, which is why I think that like, we have this myth about Linux ending at the user land boundary and what happens beyond that is somebody else's problem. No. So. Yeah, I guess I, I was kind of second, second that by saying what I think there's a problem and then, uh, and I have faced it actually myself maybe some months ago when I was discussing this um, kind of memory protection interface. So it, uh, I think some kernel people, they, they think from the kernel point of view and when you talk even about the interface addition or something like that, they think how it, they, they see how it's going to be implemented in a kernel. They see like what it takes, the complexity and things and kind of they, they see that part. But when how it's going to be used from user space and would it actually that interface make sense from user space? That's not always in the picture. So what's the end use case? And, 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 and it's like because that can affect also the interface design and decision. Are we going with this interface that way much more than just like internal kernel? So that that's I would fully second to say that I think we lack of thing to the end use case, which is actually going to be used by the user space. Like how is that interface, for example, is going to be used? Is it actually making sense to be this way from the user point of view? Because you can design very nice interface from a kernel point of view, which would be clean and implemented behind correctly and so on and so forth. But user space won't use it because it would be just, I don't know, too difficult, too clumsy, not clear, too much thinking. And we have examples, I think, like when I analyzed the libraries, was it, I think, I analyzed some of the common crypto libraries and things. I was trying to analyze how, how many of them are using, for example, features like mlock or MadAdvice um, features, which try to limit like the memory. So for example, they allocate buffers, like we have OpenSSL and other crypto libraries, which allocate buffers for the keys and so on. So do they actually use this, um, this, this kernel interfaces to, block this memory and so on. And I have I have found almost like no usages. So I found a couple of usages like I think OpenSSL was using it for the um, their secure heap functionality. So if you enable secure heap, then it would use this interface is always no. And it's an example of interface which currently exists in a kernel and from kernel point of view, it's working. So I mean, you can probably even test it. Um, I don't know for a test, but uh, I'm sure I've tested it, it works, but uh, it's not being used much and the question is why and maybe because again user space wasn't consulted yeah if i were to describe like a security to... feature oh sorry it would be it, making it hard for people to misuse them and more guardrails essentially but anyway sorry alexander yeah uh, i would like to add about user space security uh the main thing I think I think the okay, main have, uh, point about sorry, user space. Sorry, sorry just to stop, but yeah. we have I think less than one minute left. So if you could just make a quick point, because we'll have to close the panel. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the main point about user space security, the main thing the kernel should do is isolation between user space processes. So when the isolation breaks or not enough, uh, it is really bad. So the main thing that kernel should do is to isolate user space processes properly. Okay. Thank you, Alexander. So I'm afraid we're out of time. So thank you everyone who uh, attended the panel. 
uh, the participants and of course the panel members. So we can clap three panel members virtually. And I guess we will be seeing all of you tomorrow in our second day of Linux Security Summit. And at the end of the day, we'll have another panel on the same topic. So you can keep your questions also prepared. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.